and we have to really escalate the noise we make so that we'll be heard. Welcome to Gay USA. I'm Andy Hum. I'm Ann Northrup. And uh, I don't know if we actually did win a fake news award uh, today, uh, but... Uh, My prediction is they didn't hold the fake news awards today, but we'll see who's right. I hope one goes to the doctor who examined him, who says he's 239 pounds. We want you to take the uh, Gay USA challenge, Mr. President, and come in here and get weighed. That's Andy's thing. I have no involvement. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. We have a lot of serious news this week, uh, some of which involves the president and a lot of which does not. And we start off with the very sad news that uh, uh, Dr. Mathilde Krim, a true giant in the field of fighting AIDS, uh, has died at the age of 91. We're going to show you a couple of uh, uh, videos uh, relating to her that I think will be enlightening and uh, uh, important. Also in the news, the Trump administration uh, deported a gay married asylum seeker uh, with no, against the wishes of the court, and then the court brought him back. It's okay. a crazy story. So, if you're upset about all this, we're all going to get out and join the Women's March this weekend. There'll be a big one in New York on Saturday, but they're going to be across the country on Saturday and Sunday. Check your local listings. Chelsea Manning, fresh out of prison, <laughs> is going to challenge an incumbent Democratic senator in Maryland. Uh, in Wisconsin, there was a big settlement reached for the transgender student Ash Whitaker, who was discriminated against uh, by the local school district there. In Lake Forest, California, a young gay man has been viciously murdered by a former classmate. In Brooklyn, a lesbian who was raped 24 years ago and defamed by the Daily News and the New York Police Department has finally gotten some measure of justice. Too little, too late. Yes. Uh, almost all of Latin America is currently debating whether to comply with the international court decision ordering marriage equality. And we're going to review Fellow Travelers, which we saw together, a timely opera Thumbs about McCarthy-era witch hunts of gay people in government. But we start with a loving remembrance of Dr. Mathilde Krim, who has been described everywhere as a warrior in the fight against HIV and AIDS, as well she was. Yes. And a warrior in many ways, even before she got well, to that. She, w she was 91 years old, and you know she grew up in Europe in a very, very mixed background. In Europe, spoke about four or five languages. Um, you know, a Swiss father, Austrian mother, and she went to the University of Geneva in in 1945, where she had a lot of uh, uh, Jewish friends in school, and she converted to Judaism. And she joined the Irgun uh, in Israel, which were, were the gun runners underground. Uh, in the war for independence there. She was helping run guns. Did, so, she, did she convert because she married? Uh, no. She converted. Well, she did have a first she marriage. She converted because she encountered, you know, these uh, these friends at, at the University of Geneva. And she was so, as we all were, but obviously a lot of us not enough, so appalled by what happened in Europe. And in fact, what happened in Europe to Jews is what informed her work in AIDS. I mean, she was a scientist and a researcher, a, an eminent cancer a researcher. Exactly. Uh, she uh, uh, did a lot of the early research into cancer-causing viruses. Uh, but, but then she met, uh, she was, and she did this work in Israel, where yeah. she was a, a part of an institute there. Then she met Arthur Krim, who was the head of United Artists, and uh, moved to New York with him. He was on the board of, of the institute in Israel. And she the moved Weizmann to, Institute. Yeah, moved to New York with him in 1958. And she played a very important role in America in getting the National Cancer Act of 1971 passed. Remember Nixon's war on cancer? Absolutely. It's still going on. Uh, then she met Joe Sonnabend, who was a, an, a, a doctor who was encountering patients in 1980 
what eventually we came to know as AIDS, and they started talking about it. So within a couple of years, uh, she forms the AIDS Medical Foundation, later called AMFAR, uh, to get uh, to get boost research into it. Yes, and uh, along the way, as she was be getting involved at the very beginning of our knowledge of the AIDS epidemic, she uh, encountered Elizabeth Taylor, who on the West Coast was, of course, getting deeply involved in this, and they joined forces yes. to uh, form AMFAR, and both worked for decades on it uh, after then. So she, you know, she, she and Arthur have a townhouse on the Upper East Side, uh, where they both had fundraisers with all these celebrities, but they also would have meetings with activists. I was there. at uh, one of those uh, meetings. Me, me as well. and. Um, I remember a, a reporter friend of mine from the New York Native, a gay paper, uh, called her up. I'm going to have an interview with her, and and he said, uh, "What apartment number is it?" And she goes, <laughs> "It's a house, my dear." <laughs> is what she said. She well, was very low key. I, I was there with a bunch of activists <laughs> for a meeting. We we're discussing strategy, and and the butler is passing out, you know, tea and crumpets or whatever. I know, I know. It was quite a scene, but so, a beautiful house. Yes, with Oscars, she, with Oscars on the uh, piano. But she was a, a, a truly a dedicated warrior, and she wasn't just a, a dilettante in this. And no, no. I, we want to show you a couple of things. First, uh, the tribute uh, that Amfar did, a couple of minutes of video that we'll show you. From some years ago. Yes, and it was... Oh, the side of her that this shows is how she, uh, as a fundraiser and as a lobbyist, brought attention to the epidemic by, uh, in particular in her connection with Elizabeth Taylor, but with Arthur Krim as her husband, was able to reach out to a high-powered celebrity community to raise money and awareness. So uh, let's Especially because she had listened to her friends talking about the people dying of AIDS the way people talked about Jews in Germany. Yes, and, well, we'll get to that in yeah. the second piece of video. Uh, but let's start with this tribute from Amfar to Mathilde Krim. Dr. Matilda Krim marshaled others to establish the American Foundation for AIDS Research, raising awareness, raising millions for research, and raising the hopes of countless people bravely confronting this deadly disease. For three decades, Dr. Matilda Krim has been a leader in the fight against AIDS. I became involved in HIV research in the spring of 81, and we had a sense of urgency. We had the people around us dying every day. From the outset of her scientific research on HIV AIDS, Dr. Krim boldly confronted broader social and political questions about the epidemic. The AIDS crisis has also become a crisis of public confusion about the nature of the epidemic, and also a moral crisis. Her courage and her thoughtful advocacy, her willingness to confront and challenge fear and prejudice, changed the public conversation about AIDS. Matilda Krim uh, called me and invited me to uh, visit her in uh, New York. And um, that afternoon, I had an awakening. From that time on, I have been a foot soldier in the battle on uh, HIV uh, AIDS. Please welcome a true hero and uh, someone I idolize, Dr. Matilda Krim. It is important that leadership in the AIDS crisis include countering prejudice and discrimination. In the course of her brilliant career, Dr. Matilda Krim has shown us that the benefits of scientific research will only be as great as our understanding and compassion allow. We want to continue believing and teaching that each human life has the same value as any other. So the other video we want to show you is from a local interview years ago. It may even have been a, a, an m and interview, I'm not sure, uh, for a show or a series called Totally Cool, where she was interviewed by uh, a local guy named uh, Richard Renda. 
And in this, what I like about this is that she sits down and talks about uh, the real beginning of our uh, observation of the epidemic and how our understanding of it evolved at the very, very beginning and how her understanding of it evolved not only scientifically, but socially in terms of the discrimination. And I think it's in its own quiet way a very powerful and, uh, you know, uh, brief but uh, poignant description of uh, what went on long before many of us were involved in activism. To be facing, it was a, an extraordinary situation also, you know, to realize that you were seeing the birth of a new disease. We didn't know anything about it. And uh, little by little, we could, by studying the early patients, eliminate certain possible causes. You know, at first we thought drugs or what people eat or drink or do, but quickly we could el eliminate those as a reason for this disease. And we came to the conclusion that it must be an infectious disease, it must be transmissible. And as soon as the first women and the first babies and the first old folks who had received blood transfusion came down with it, we could also say it's an infectious agent, that it's transmissible through blood right. and, and sex. Right, yeah. And that was late 1981, 1982. It was very early. We had that suspicion. <clears throat> So then, an infectious agent, you know, that we know microbes don't uh, distinguish between gay, straight, or female, male, uh, young or old. In we became very frightened like that. We this in 81. Uh, I would say 82, you know, that we knew we were going to face an epidemic and it was going to affect everybody. Uh, in. Um, Let's say in, in the mid mid eighties, after the virus was identified, and it took a few months to really uh, convince ourselves that a new virus was involved. We also realized that uh, this virus was not making sometimes people sick. That the rule was that somebody who acquired the virus also developed full, full blown AIDS. We know today that there are some exceptions, but we know there are very few exceptions. And so we were dealing with a disease that was not only transmissible, serious, but lethal most of the time. And it was really scary. And what was scary too was the reaction of our authorities and the public in general, you know, saying it's them, it's uh, people who don't deserve attention and help and so on. Um, or not believing that. Uh, you know, they would say it's only gay sex who transmits this virus, and we knew full well it was not only gay sex. Uh, for a long time, even our Department of Health here in New York was calling, uh, you know, the gay bars, places of risk, they tried to close them, but the straight, uh, uh, you know, public uh, accommodations for sexual orgies were not closed. Well, isn't it, true, isn't it true that it wasn't until the summer of 1985 that the government admitted that heterosexuals could get AIDS? Yeah, that's true too. That's what I'm talking about, yeah, exactly. you know. So we were saying it, but we were blowing in the wind. I mean, the authorities, the people that the public respects and listens to are saying nothing, uh, let alone <coughs> the religious authorities who were saying the opposite of what we scientists were saying. And it made of the whole issue an issue of morality, which was uh, ridiculous. And uh, we're wiping, uh, you know, we're whipping up um, uh, discrimination and, uh, right. and prejudice. Right. Early insight. Yes. Uh, I mean, the, the epidemic was driven by bigotry, and she knew that, and that's one of the reasons she was so passionate about it. You know, she initially came into it, she, was, she studied interferon, and she thought that might have a role in this. It turned out it didn't uh, in terms of solving the problem, but she wanted investment in whatever could work. She, uh, Mark Harrington of Treatment Action Group says that she was a tremendous ally in their fight to institute parallel track, which got 35,000 people on DDI, which was the first drug 
broad fallback from AZT in those days, and it helped save a lot of lives. She was also one of the first, long before ACT UP and TAG came along, to object to placebo trials and say right. that would uh, uh, extend the time before we got drugs and were inappropriate. And she and her groups invested in needle exchange programs when everybody in the government was fighting it and allowing it to get out of control. In this country, they had needle exchange in Europe and they didn't have a, a, an HIV epidemic among injecting drug users, but we refused in this country. But she tried to stop that. And one of her real impetuses for getting involved with this and understanding it so clearly, so quickly, was her experience with the Holocaust and 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 seeing the parallels and yes. the stigma and the uh, the genocide? Uh, I, you know, I wish her voice were here today because she'd be saying the same thing about what we're going through right now. And Liz Taylor too. Yes, and you know, this is a woman who literally could be said to have saved the lives of millions of people by, mm -hmm. the, by the work that she did. And yeah. the two of them together, what we're a team! We're tremendously sad yeah. about losing her. Uh, but happy she lived a long and uh, certainly enormously productive life, dying at 91. Yes. You know, she she was the one who hosted Mandela when he got out of jail in oh, the United yeah. States at, a, at her house. Uh, to I raise was. money, she was a lifelong supporter of the African National Congress, mm -hmm. not just like a you know late one. She always supported that. So it's all of a piece, folks. A all visionary. Of a piece, all of a piece. And yeah. an activist. Uh, yes. We miss her. Yeah. All right, well, in her honor, perhaps, we will be out this weekend marching against the Trump administration, marking the one-year anniversary of uh, his inauguration. Which and seems the... to have hit a new low this week, <laughs> if that's possible. Well, I just want to tell people, if you do not yet know what's going on in your area and you want to find a march near you, just Google Women's March 2018 with your location, and yes. you'll find information about what's going on. Yeah. Here in New York, we're gathering uh, on Central Park West, north of Columbus Circle, Saturday morning, and marching down Broadway and 6th Avenue to Bryant Park. We should be having big protests just for what happened in the last week. Uh, the Justice Department, they still call it that, uh, is no longer going to accept complaints by transgender students about discrimination. They say we have no jurisdiction over this. Oh, I thought uh, that was the Department of Education. Uh, I, I read it as the uh, read it as justice, but all right, it could Perhaps be education. Both. Uh, the courts have ruled repeatedly that. Uh, transgender students are covered under Title IX under sex discrimination, so you do still have that recourse until Trump gets finished stacking the courts. And one mm -hmm. of the ones he wants to put in, who is being stalled, is this Tennessee Senator Mark Norris uh, in, in the Federal District Court in Western Tennessee. Uh, the Senate has not voted on his nomination yet. He has a long record of voter suppression, opposition to same-sex marriage, although he, is, he says he accepts the law now. They all come in and they say, well, that's the law now. Yes, that's a tautology, but when the Trump judges get in there, they'll overturn it. Yes, the fact that they uh, accept the reality of the law is certainly unusual in this administration. I will give you that. But it doesn't mean they're not going to try to change it when they get power. I mean, this guy even supported uh, a uh, letting therapists turn away gay clients. He's very anti-refugee, etc. Then there's the Department of Health and Human Services, Boy. which is preparing a new religious exemption rule so that health care providers will not have to engage in any icky stuff they don't want to do as long as they can assert a religious exemption, plus which if their, say, hospital takes away their privileges, if they won't do the services the hospital wants to provide, then the hospital will be now, punished. In fairness, this is somewhat of a, of a reversion to what was done under George W. Bush and changed by Obama. But the guy who heads the uh, Office of Human Rights the Office of Human Rights in HHS, Roger Severino, is a longtime activist against abortion, against gay rights, et cetera. And uh, by the way, in uh, Friday, on Friday, this is all in, in the run-up to the to the big anti-abortion march that's taking place on Friday in Washington. And correct about Roe v. Wade. There is one strange mystery uh, event that took place in the administration this week that. One? That first sounds <laughs> one that hasn't been talked about so much. 
In the Health and Human Services Department, the head of the Office of Population Affairs was this woman, Teresa Manning, yeah, yeah. who we had talked about when she was first appointed. She's anti, she's heading the Office of Family Planning and uh, Population Affairs, and she's against uh, contraception, huh. she's against an anything like that. Well, she got fired and escorted out of the building in about three seconds what last happened? week. They cleared the floor where she was working. Did she they have a gun? Was told, she exercising her Second Amendment rights? They told everybody to get out of that floor and take their computers with them. And then they fired her what and escorted so her out of it. We don't a, know. However, she is being temporarily replaced by the... Uh, woman who uh, believes that uh, abstinence education is the way to go for... Oh, good. Nothing's going to change. <laughs> Continuity. But if you have any information on what the heck happened to Teresa Manning, please, well, please Trump share also, it. Trump also issued his proclamation for Religious Freedom Day this week. Uh, here's a quote. No American, whether a nun, nurse, baker, or business owner, should be forced to choose between the tenets of faith or adherence to law. How did uh, they come up with that list? He talks about in this thing Islamic terrorism, but not Christian terrorism, uh, b by the fine people of his base. All right, so uh, just another, uh, and do we have any uh, comment on the S-holes meeting and uh, all of that? It, it, you know, I read a comment by somebody just, just in the comment section of the paper said it's the first time I cried over what's going on here. I mean, you know, you don't want this guy to get to you, but it, it, that's what I mean by things sinking so low, that this just d despicable conduct, this, uh, ref, you know, it's all this white supremacism, uh, Norway, although, uh, are we sure that Norway is a white majority country? Well, my the, favorite the head, of, the head of Homeland Security isn't sure. Yeah, well, my favorite comment on that was Stephen Colbert. <laughs> Your name is Christian <laughs> Nielsen <laughs> with a silent J. <laughs> wow. Very cute. And then there's, the, then there's this horrendous story of what the administration did this week uh, to a, uh, a gay Mexican, Mexican immigrant asylum seeker. His name is Carlos Bringas Rodriguez. He's married to a guy, Michael Young, in Kansas City. Um, and they they took almost a month to get him back after he was well, legally deported. Uh, he le they came and got him in the middle of the night. He's well, they said they said he missed an appointment that they sent to the wrong address purposely. They did not. They their excuse was that he missed a court hearing on his deportation. He never got the notice of the hearing, and he says because they deliberately sent it elsewhere, but he hadn't, he didn't know about the area. Right. They came and got him in the middle of the night. They threw him into Mexico at 3 a.m. He's HIV positive. He, they gave him, uh, let him take a few medicines, and now he's, uh, you know, abandoned in Mexico. And he's married. Meanwhile, which, yeah. meanwhile, the court that was hearing his asylum plea had said he had a right to asylum right. and could continue to petition for that. But the U.S. government ignored that court uh, decision and got rid of him anyway. Well, they ignored all the evidence in this case, and his testimony was that in his hometown of Veracruz, Mexico, he was raped and sexually abused by relatives and neighbors. And that's why he was seeking the asylum court since the 2010. The court, court did not ignore that uh, evidence. The, no, I'm they saying were that giving the him asylum. The administration, the administration did. ignored everything, and just why they targeted him is a question. But they uh, they picked him up and threw him back into Mexico, literally, and it took more court orders to get him back here. He is now well, back here. speaking of courts, it's nice to see uh, Senator Jeff Flake stand up to the, you know, the fake news awards of, of Trump, but he votes for all these judges who are going to take away all our rights. Yep. All uh, right. As does Lindsey Graham. So, protests. All right. All right. So, uh... Well, in, in terms of protests against Trump, uh, Adam Rippon, who's the first out gay male figure skater going to the Olympics for the United States at the age of 28, he came out publicly in 2015, and he said if he was invited to the White House, you know, if he, get, if he wins, he says, I don't think someone like me would be welcome there. I know it's what it's like to go into a room and feel you're not wanted. If I talk to people the way that President Trump talks to people, my mom would kick my ass, he said. <laughs>
And, and Gus Kenworthy, the out free, free skier, also said he wouldn't go. He says, I have no interest in faking support. Well, I guess the uh, U.S. Olympic team is not going to be invited to the White well, House. Well, we'll see. Well, we got I, a, we, by the way, we have the second openly gay uh, figure skater from Canada, Eric Radford. He's going to be he's going to be there. He's getting married to his Spanish boyfriend, who is a nice dancer, Luis. There have Fanero. been. Uh, it's hard to imagine he's only the second. No, 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 uh, in this Olympics. Uh, that's come out okay. for this Olympics. All right, let's move back to politics. Uh, Chelsea Manning, <laughs> <laughs> famously imprisoned, uh, transgender activist, uh, imprisoned for uh, giving uh, government classified information to WikiLeaks to expose the misdeeds of the U.S. government in Afghanistan and Iraq. And was imprisoned in the longest sentence ever served by a whistleblower. Considered by some a traitor, considered by others a hero. There's quite a discussion even within the community. Yes, there is. Uh, I think uh, I certainly come down on the hero side because yes. I'm always in favor of these whistleblowers. Uh, you know, Chelsea Manning, Daniel Ellsberg, there's oh. a long line. So, uh, uh, Chelsea Manning is now living in Maryland and has decided to run for the United States Senate. But there's a sitting Democratic senator there, Ben Cardin, who I think is a, a well, perfectly decent senator. He comes from a long line of Cardins in that seat. Uh, you know, everybody's, you know, everybody, it's a democracy, anybody can run, and it's, it's good for people to raise issues. Are we going to run Chelsea's ad or not? Chelsea has done a political commercial that's a little dicey from our point of view, but we thought you'd be interested in seeing it. So let's take a look at Chelsea's first political ad. I'm Chelsea Manning and I approve this message. We live in trying times. Times of fear. Of suppression. Of hate. We don't need more or better leaders. We need someone willing to fight. We need to stop asking them to give us our rights. They won't support us. They won't compromise. We need to stop expecting that our systems will somehow fix themselves. We need to actually take the reins of power from them. We need to challenge them at every level. We need to fix this. We don't need them anymore. We can do better. You're damn right we got this. Well, I will give Chelsea credit <laughs> for being bold. <laughs> for someone who has been so vilified and imprisoned and everything else, she has not taken an inch step backwards. No. But it's a little scary. Oh, I mean, uh, there was a very strong message delivered by the Republican candidate for president last year about shaking up the system as well. <laughs> and we do want to shake it up, and we do want better, totally. better people. Which is why we'll, we'll be out on the street on Saturday. And I would like to get rid of uh, the traitorous Democrat New York State Senator Jeff Klein now uh, in the Bronx. This is one of the guys who caucuses with the Republicans to keep them in power in New York State Senate. And uh, he's been accused of uh, forcing his tongue down the mouth of a female colleague. He held a press conference about this before she came out with her, her accusation to deny it. By the way, uh, at the risk of stepping into uh, quicksand, uh, this Aziz Ansari debate, you know, how can he, is this anonymous woman is ruining his career for what was basically a bad date? How can she accuse him? I think people are missing the point. Uh, the point is that... and. That, there are women out there saying, uh, you know, he had no power. How can you talk about a power differential? He's a, uh, he's a man. Of course he had power. That's the whole point of this discussion, that men do have power, that women uh, concede that power or acknowledge that power by not getting up and walking out. Uh, women stay in those situations because they don't want to be hated. 
Uh, they don't want to be slut shamed. They don't right. want to be whatever. And and uh, are there gradations between Harvey Weinstein and uh, Aziz Ansari? Of course. But the point is not these individual cases. The point is the overall need to change the power structure. You know, we we ran a video on the show once, and I invite you to just Google sexual consent under videos, and there are many videos about this, which will calmly explain what's involved in consent in a sexual relationship. People think, oh, I'm going to need a contract, and I'm going to need to video you agreeing to this beforehand. Just read about it, think about it, and make all of your may all your relationships be consensual. Well, I did. I saw a debate between uh, two women this week on uh, probably MSNBC. One with this sort of knee-jerk, "How dare they?" reaction, uh, and the, we have to draw a bright line between the uh, the Harvey Weinstein's and the Aziz. No, we have to look at the overall picture. And the other one said, look, what we need is early education yes. of men and women to change yes. the dynamic here. And that is what we need. We need people to go into these situations as colleagues, not adversaries. It starts in grade school where, you know, uh, boys often try to dominate discussions and things. I get hell. If I interrupt Ann on this show, some of you don't like when <laughs> Ann interrupts me, but we try to have a conversation and respect each other. I right. See, going to a private girls' school is what <laughs> teaches you to be able to fight back. I didn't interrupt girls at my high school <laughs> because we didn't have any. <laughs> exactly. Uh, except for a couple of teachers. All right, back to politics. Well, uh, governor Ralph Northam was sworn in as the new governor of Virginia, and his first act on his first day was to issue an executive order declaring a non-discrimination policy for state employees that covers sexual orientation and gender identity. Now, uh, previous uh, Governor McAuliffe also had a sexual orientation executive order for state employees, but Northam added gender yes, identity for the for first this time. One, yeah. And the Republicans in the legislature, they're still in a thin majority there. They've been chastened. They've introduced no bathroom bills and no anti abortion measures. Of course, it's early yet. Well, but. You know, these are the kinds of things that normally would be reintroduced on the first day. Well, they lost 15 it. seats in the... Uh, but Tennessee is not giving up. They've, uh, they've added a bunch of anti-LGBT bills again, including one. Uh, uh, they will fund schools who need to defend their transphobic bathroom regulations. In New Hampshire, the House there killed a proposed ban on conversion therapy for minors. They said we don't need it. When the there's no evidence it happens. The state can already punish coercion. And we need to help straight people uh, who are concerned about their temporary gay crushes. <laughs> they need this conversion <laughs> therapy. Well, they, really? also, they also said that the professional associations have the right to regulate what happens. And that's, that had been happening before we started passing these laws. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm for these laws. Uh, but that, that can happen. Well, they're having a big fight over one in Tampa, Florida. They passed a conversion therapy ban, uh, but the right wing in the person of, of course, the Alliance Defending Freedom and a couple of professionals, uh, professional counselors, are going to court to try to overturn it on First Amendment grounds. Our side is fighting that, uh, and that's going to turn into a big battle in Tampa. In New Jersey, they swore in Governor Phil Murphy, and he said, I'm not going to run away from the progressive platform that I won the primary on. He wants legalized pot, a $15 minimum wage, a millionaire's tax, and a bill of rights for undocumented immigrants, and automatic voter registration, and early voting, and a right to join a party on the day of the election. So this is the kind, you know, when you get elected, you, you better satisfy what people have been yearning for, or you're not going to get reelected. Well, I would say when you get elected on a platform like that, take the opportunity to push it instead of immediately falling back to some kind of more moderate uh, position. Try, you know, progressive uh, uh, attitudes are popular. Well, I mean, 
when Barack Obama came in and he was supposed to reform health care, he compromised before he started. And that's how we ended up with the Affordable Care Act. My right? point exactly. Instead of saying, we need universal health insurance for everybody. We Be need Medicare for all. And then you might have had to make some compromises on that, but you don't start off with a compromise. Be ambitious. Right. Matilde Krim uh, would say be ambitious. Hillary Clinton did the same thing when she tried to reform health care. Yeah. Yep. You get tied up in knots. Besides which, it's much easier to explain to people when you say, oh, you see what old people have? Medicare. We're going to give it to everybody. And then you want to get something fancy for your nose job, you go right ahead. <laughs> in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, yeah. the school board is paying trans student Ash Whitaker $800,000 for pervasive ongoing discrimination. And the school district, he. Uh, Ash won at the uh, appeals court level. Did we show Ash's picture? Yeah, we, have, we have a picture Ash of Ash. Somewhere. Anyway, keep anyway, going. We, uh, Ash, won Ash. At, Ash won at the appeals court level, and then part of this agreement is that the school district's not going to uh, appeal to the Supreme Court. And they're also saying when, when Ash comes back for alumni activities, will not be discriminated against. Um, nice. He's now at the University of Wisconsin-Madison studying biomedical engineering. Uh, in Utah, uh, a trans man and a trans woman are suing for the ability to change their gender on their driver's licenses. In they, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. In Wisconsin, uh, this is not a specifically LGBT story, but uh, we flipped a state Senate seat to the Democrats that had been in Republican hands since as they say, the beginning of the century, you know, 17 years ago, and uh, that Trump won by 17 points. So that's all very encouraging that I'm not... <laughs> There's a lot of mourning going on in the Wisconsin Republican Party right now. Well, and we're awaiting They're the scared. Supreme Court decision about whether their maps were illegal mm -hmm. because they were drawn on a very highly partisan basis. Speaking of maps, I'll take advantage of that right. segue, uh, the Movement Action, uh, Movement Advancement Project, known as MAP, yeah. uh, has put out a new report on public accommodations, non-discrimination laws. So this is a, uh, a device that will show you all over the country what the state of non-discrimination laws is. So it's a very handy tool for you to figure out what is, what you have in your area and what you don't have and can be a great starting point for activism uh, right. in your neighborhood. LGBTmap.org is where you will find that report on non-discrimination laws. If you travel to Alabama, you won't be able to get a marriage license. Nobody can get a marriage license anymore in Alabama. They have uh, ended them. Uh, now you send the probate judge some kind of an affidavit, and you pay the same fee as you were going to pay for a marriage license. Uh, but it's obviously just a thing against us. Well, it's a thing so that public officials do not have to conduct marriage ceremonies. You can't go to the local uh, county clerk or whatever to have your marriage performed. Now you either have to go to a religious uh, officiant or just do your own ceremony or just send them an affidavit. You don't even have to have We're a married. ceremony. Yeah, we have declared ourselves That's married. That's how it used to work. People didn't start going to churches even for weddings until not too long ago. Uh, let's get to some uh, sad uh, right. stories of violence. Terrible. In L.A., California, a trans woman, Vicky Gutierrez, originally from Honduras, uh, was murdered. Well, it was, a, it was a suspicious fire in her home uh, in the Pico Union neighborhood on January 10th. I don't know how they've classified Well, they've the arrested a suspect, yeah. so, uh, right. and quite quickly, actually, the uh, local activists are praising the police for then the, quick action. And then there's the case in Lake Forest in California uh, at a place called Borrego Park. A student, uh, 19 years old, named Blaze Bernstein, he went missing on January 3rd, big search. He was found dead on January 10th. And they've arrested, uh, that was, that's a picture of uh, Blaze. They've arrested a, a guy named Samuel Woodward, 20, who was an old classmate of his, that's him on the left, uh, uh, who st uh, allegedly stabbed him 20 times. Now, these two, they went to, they went to high school together. Mm -hmm. in, and, and, you know, uh, Blaze went on to University of Pennsylvania, uh, the other kid was stayed back in school here. They had been flirting a bit since June. Uh, they, uh, Bernstein at the time told friends that Woodward was about to hit on him and made, made him promise not to tell. But then they agreed to get together on vacation 
And then Woodward is now saying to the police, first of all, he tried to cover up the crime, but then now he's trying to say, you know, he came after me, and he's trying to use the gay panic defense, and, and I, you know, I pushed him away and stabbed him 20 times to death. So, um, anyway, uh, and this kid, Woodward, was, uh, had a deep background in far-right organizations waving Confederate flags. It's a, it's a very messy story. In another uh, violent story, many years ago, a, uh, uh, in 1994, in fact, a lesbian in Brooklyn was raped in Prospect Park. Uh, but she was not treated well by the local news media and police. Uh, columnist for the Daily News, Mike McAlary. Very famous, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner. Wrote horrible columns about her. Getting fed news from the police, she wasn't raped, she's a lesbian, and they put all this in the stories to try to discredit her because they weren't getting to the bottom of the case. Yeah. And she sued uh, the Daily News and Mike McAlary and uh, didn't get anything because the, the, the court said, well, that's what the police told her. Who from the police told her this? John told, Miller. Told him, not her. Oh, sorry, oh, yeah, told Mike McAlary. John Miller, who is now, you see him on television all the time. He's the head of sort of the anti-terrorism unit in the New York City Police Department, but he used to be a correspondent on ABC and CBS and all these places. Um, but, you know, He's saying, oh, you know, I'm sorry about it. I didn't know, you know, but. Um, he has now apologized uh, because. Apology not they, accepted they by now finally, New York City. They finally investigated DNA evidence because she said she was raped and they took DNA off her yeah. clothes, uh, they, which they never did anything with. They have finally uh, analyzed the DNA and connected it to a guy who's in prison for rape. This guy, subsequent to this, raped four other women. So that's the consequence of them uh, trying to cover up their misdeeds in this case. Outrageous. Very outrageous. Uh, the cold case team at the NYPD did the investigation. Yes. And, and a credit found is being it. given to Chief O'Neill, who's the new uh, police commissioner. Uh, police commissioner. Uh, he's not the chief; he's the commissioner. Um, more harassment of uh, male models. We told you a little bit about the misdeeds of Bruce Weber and Mario Testino. These are two of the top photographers to the royal family, to Vanity Fair. All these things—they've all been fired from everything at this point because all these models have come out of the woodwork and told these horrendous stories of the way these photographers treated them behind closed doors. There is also bad lesbian behavior in the news. Uh, <laughs> Melanie Williams Bethea, who was the uh, former administrator for financial aid at Columbia University Teachers College, has now been accused of taking kickbacks on financial aid. She was in charge of it, so she was giving all the money to her girlfriends and... Hundreds of thousands of dollars to three women who were her girlfriends who then kicked back a lot of it to her. Who didn't even go to school. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, one one uh, had been a graduate student since 2007, but since at least 2010, she's not been taking classes or actively pursuing her degree. Two others were enrolled since 2005 and have not obtained their degrees. Interesting little scheme. Oh, what a tangled web we weave. Not a good story. All right. In also not a good story. Uh, in Blount County, Tennessee, two Baptist churches have dropped out of a program to help homeless families after they found out that the program was helping a lesbian couple with three kids. Sweet. Well, heteros you know, heterosexuals can be, can, can be bad, too. You saw that story <laughs> about that couple that had their 13 kids chained Aye. to the beds. Uh, oh, wow. I mean, I wasn't going to talk about it, but... Just want to balance the uh, news here. And in Chicago, Illinois, North Park University, which is an evangelical uh, Christian school uh, associated with the Evangelical Covenant Church, has suspended Pastor Judy Peterson because she officiated at a same-sex wedding. There's what a, Judy. What about her religious freedom? Uh, the, at the University of Iowa, the business leaders in Christ group is suing for religious discrimination because they're not getting government funding because they exclude uh, gay people who uh, don't believe that homosexuality is wrong. 
That's a big. It's a big case. If and then you have non-discrimination laws and you're discriminating, you don't get government funding. That's the same as with like Catholic adoption agencies who then complain that their religious freedom is being violated. No, you can have your religious freedom. You can do whatever you want, but you cannot expect government funding for discriminatory practices. And in Arizona, dare I describe her as a bad lesbian, Kimberly McLaughlin is uh, trying to get the uh, overturn the high court decision that said, no, your wife uh, is, also has rights to, to the, the child. She's saying, well, that's not Arizona law. Arizona law doesn't recognize automatic uh, Look, uh, paternity. You're, uh, you're, you're married, you divorce, you have a child together, you both get to uh, sue for custody and visitation. She's appealing to the Supreme Court. Oh, and by the way, in Ohio, folks, uh, they've fin they're finally starting to at least have hearings on the Fairness Act, the LGBT rights law bill there, for the first time in 10 years, so get on it. When will that happen in the United States Congress? Well, exactly. All right, let's move on to international we, news because we yeah, don't have we all don't the time, time in go. the world. All right, the, uh, 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 we told you last week about the, uh, uh, the Latin American, the Inter-American Court uh, for, human, for rights. human Rights declaring uh, marriage should be legal in all the countries that uh, so acknowledge them. Costa Rica, it was a Costa Rican case. They're going along with it. We expect to have a marriage on Saturday there. We do, I think, do we even have a picture? Maybe no. we don't. We don't. But uh, anyway, the, the, and the president of the country said, you know, uh, our citizens uh, today are freer. So uh, stuff is happening in Panama. Yeah, in Haiti, there's resistance to the, to the ruling. In, in Paraguay, the activists are, are pressing it. In Peru, they're examining the situation. In Ecuador, are cases. Now, in a lot of these places, you have cases pending, especially for recognition of marriages performed elsewhere. And, and that's the how they're point, starting in on this. Well, and the, the point is that the courts in those cases are going to have to go by the yes. ruling by the Inter-American Court. Uh, Haiti has a law against same-sex marriage, so someone's got to come up with yes. a case there. So, Meanwhile, the European Court of Justice Advocate General said, issued an opinion that same-sex spouses must get full equal rights in all European Union countries. And there are some of those countries in Eastern Europe that do not recognize uh, same-sex spouses. So this is a big upheaval there. And and, We've told you that things are opening up in India. They have now set hearings in March about the ban on gay sex, but they're also going to hear challenges to the adultery law and the law about women being allowed to enter a temple that they were excluded from. And the out gay prince Manvendra Singh Gohil uh, in India will build an LGBT center on his palace grounds. It will have rooms for people to stay, a medical clinic, uh, English and vocational training, and so things may be moving in India. In Australia, Billie Jean King wants the wants Margaret Court's name taken off the arena there, the the, uh, the tennis arena. She says if you're going to have your name on something, it's important that you be hospitable, inclusive, and welcoming. Uh, she says uh, maybe we. This is why Trump has to put his own name on things because no one would name anything after him. Billie Jean says uh, that anyone is welcome at her court uh, at the U.S. Open and... Even Margaret Court. <laughs> well, she was a big supporter of Margaret oh, yes. Court. She lobbied for this naming of the stadium, but she says she's heartbroken that, at what Margaret Court has said about her and us and uh, everybody else since she became so fanatically uh, Christian. Margaret Court's the one who lost to Bobby Riggs, yes. right? Yes. yes. And, and Billie Jean did not want her to get pulled into that fight, but then she took it on afterwards herself. Yes. Uh, also, news from Australia, Cher will headline the <laughs> Sydney 40th LGBT Mardi Gras on March 3rd get your tickets now or go see her in Las Vegas. Hey, Grindr users, a Chinese company now has full control of Grindr and the concern here is security in terms of the Chinese government getting into these files and saying, we want to know about these yeah. people. In Egypt, nine more gay men have been arrested at a private house uh, party for debauchery and being a threat to public security. The police acted on a tip that weird men uh, were visiting an apartment. And they have proposed a whole new law to really, fully, completely outlaw yes. homosexuality. And not just gay people will be illegal, but if you 
help gay people. If you run a bar that welcomes gay people, you can be prosecuted too. That sounds like the California initiative that we defeated with Harvey Milk back in the 70s. Well, this teachers. is this is proposed. It hasn't been passed yet. We'll keep an eye and on it. And in Bermuda, cruise ships are canceling weddings on ships uh, that are booked for J J July 2019. They're only going to do them through this month, I think. And because We're still waiting to see if the governor general will sign or reject the anti the repeal of uh, marriage rights for same-sex okay. couples and conversion to civil unions, uh, so current cruise ship weddings will take place, but ones in the future are being canceled. Okay. And in Israel, they have a new uh, system that is more advanced than the United States. They are going to allow gay men to donate blood. Yes. Uh, the blood will be checked when it's donated, then frozen for four months, then checked again, and there. It should do that for everybody. They should do that for everybody. Uh, they're going to do this for a two-year trial and see how it works out, and then maybe they will do it for everybody. And in other AIDS news, uh, White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who's, you know, liar in chief. <laughs> I don't know who's a bigger liar. Her I don't know why Trump. they go to these press conferences. I don't either. They should just go and say, liar, liar, pants on fire. Anyway, she was asked about the firing of the HIV AIDS Council and whether it would be replaced. Uh, the Washington Blades, Chris Johnson, asked her about that. And she says, we're looking at different options meaning leave me alone, we're not doing anything about this. Better news, uh, we've been telling you about it, but now Florida is offering PrEP at all 67 local county uh, health offices. Florida has the third highest rate of new HIV infections in the country, and your PrEP will be free. Excellent. Uh, not so good news, uh, a new court case in Brooklyn, New York, Avril Nolan is a young woman whose picture, for whatever reason, was on Getty Images. Yes. So the New York State uh, Division of Human Rights takes that picture without consulting Avril <laughs> and makes this poster saying, I am positive, meaning HIV positive, I have rights. And now they're trying to say, oh, well, but well, there's nothing wrong with having HIV. Avril <laughs> is not no. HIV positive. Well, and the picture was taken for an article about New Yorker's tastes in music for an online publication. I mean, it, it, you know, she's not a model. Uh, this guy sold a picture that he took a while ago and put it into a file, and they just pulled it up. I mean, I think she's got a case. So she sues and says, <laughs> excuse me. For 1.5 million. I don't have HIV. You've grabbed my picture for no good reason without consulting me. And New York State says, well, you know, uh, there's no problem with HIV. Uh, why are you upset? And the court, uh, the appellate division here says, HIV continues to be a significant stigma, I mean, you know, she and can, therefore she can sue. She could call the Speaker of the Council, Corey Johnson, as a witness. I mean, he has come out about having HIV, but, you know, he didn't want to do that right away, and it took him a while to be public about it because people don't want to talk about it these days in many cases. And some people well, think that shame has gotten even higher in some cases because, you know, you're expected to, oh, you're supposed to know about this, and pe people come out less. And also they don't have to come out because... Look, they, they have drugs. They, they stole her picture, and they said something about her with the picture that's not true. Yes. That alone should be well, worth a models, major award. Models do appear, agree to appear in drug ads for which they're not. But agree. Uh, yeah, again, agree. Yes. And so drug companies, if they're saying someone is HIV positive in an ad, do use HIV positive models. Wow. And, uh, you know, gay couples have sued when right-wing groups have used pictures of them yes. in anti-gay ads. Yes, I agree. I think she's got a good case. Uh, and uh, I know Anne doesn't like me to talk about these things, but the, there's a new HIV vaccine research thing in San Diego that Fauci calls an excellent study. Oh, come on. Do you want to make a... The list of Fauci's promises <laughs> is equal to the list of Trump's lies. Are you lies. saying why does he still have that job? Yes. Because he's been there since the very beginning. Oh my God! All right. Uh, we all we hope desire for a, a cure. cure. Yes, we do. Meanwhile, test and treat.
Okay. Entertainment news? Yes. All right. Uh, congratulations to Ricky Martin and Juan Yosef, who married uh, recently, and we have a picture of the happy couple. There's Ricky on the right there, and I'm going to be watching him. Uh, as we're taping on Wednesday tonight on the uh, assassination of Gianni Versace. He plays Gianni's lover. And Juan is a well-known uh, artist of Arab uh, descent, and there were a couple of articles this week about uh, an exhibition in Detroit uh, that at the Arab American Museum that includes a gay artist, not Juan, another one. Uh, but that's getting some notice. Now, we went to the opera. Dearborn. We yes, went to we the did. opera. Now, it's only about the fourth opera I've seen in my life. This one is called Fellow Travelers at the Prototype Festival, and it's based on a Thomas Mal Malin novel about the McCarthy era witch hunt of gays. And I'll tell you, I, it makes me sorry. I've been passing up opera all these years. So I was extremely moved by this. And it, it you know, it's, it's about love in the shadows in mm -hmm. the 50s, where you could get fired, and there were people always looking at you and trying to investigate you and get you thrown out of there. The composer was Greg. Gregory Spears, um, and uh, you and know, I particularly enjoyed the libretto. I thought it was really well written. Greg, Greg Pierce, Pierce yeah, did yeah, the yeah, libretto, yeah. Uh, and but of course, it's gotten know, excellent reviews. We've been talking about it all, all all through this show. Our government still doesn't protect our equal rights in this country. So you're watching this like it's some artifact from sixty something years ago, but. And people are in the audience who don't know the history are sort of gasping at uh, some of the things that happen. Well, it still goes on. Well, uh, by the way, the woman in it, uh, Devin Guthrie, who, play, who played the best really friend of one of them terrific. and worked for the other, she was just terrific. So this as Mary. Uh, this uh, opera is uh, first of all executive produced by our old friend Sterling Zinsmeyer, who was an activist in New York for many years, now lives in Santa Fe. It originated at the Cincinnati Opera, and it's uh, it's uh, regarded as a chamber opera, smaller opera, but it's already being produced not only in New York, but next in Chicago, where it's being produced by Renee Fleming, the uh, oh. uh, famous soprano, at the Chicago Lyric Opera in March, and then at the Minneapolis Opera in mm -hmm. June. The Minnesota Opera, I think, is what they, don't they call it the Minnesota, or is it Minneapolis? Minneapolis. Okay. Uh, that's the way I wrote it down, but it's in Minneapolis. June 16th through 23rd Yeah, in, All right. Min in Minneapolis. Uh, this Friday, American Masters, Lorraine Hansberry on PBS, and it will be repeated. Look for that, uh, the great lesbian uh, playwright who died young of cancer. And then the, uh, the NBC, series, NBC series called Rise, which is due in March, is about a U.S. true story about a U.S. drama teacher putting on a high school production of Spring Awakening, controversial uh, musical. It's a, you know, uh, but the producer, Jason Katty, Kat, Kat, Katims. Katims. This he's, guy. He's changing the teacher's sexuality from gay to heterosexual so people can connect more with the character. No, so he can oh, connect, he can more, connect more, more with the story. Oh, we're going to explore gay issues, but come on. And we gave him an alcoholic son, so what do you want? <laughs> I, I saw a couple of movies this weekend, Molly's Game, which I thought was pretty good, and The Shape of Water, which I now think is the movie of the year. Do yourself a favor, go see The Shape of Water. Interspecies Love. Excellent. Uh, and I saw, no, go ahead. Timothy Chalamet uh, is donating his fee from the latest, the newest Woody Allen movie to Time's Up, the feminist uh, group, the LGBT Center in New York, mm -hmm. and the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. And I saw John Lithgow in Stories by Heart. It's a one-man show, very deeply moving. He not only reads stories that he was told as a kid from a book that his father read, who was a theater producer, but he talks about his father in such moving terms. It's a wonderful show. Treat yourself. And uh, we mourn the death of Carol Hart, who made Free to Be You and Me, which was almost censored by ABC. They didn't want Rosie Greer to do It's OK to Cry by Boys Too Gay. So it's only January, but I'm already exhausted. The news <laughs> has really picked up. But we'll be marching on Saturday. Hope to see you there. Women's March 2018. Google it. Bye-bye.